when we are talking about the history of Nigeria, some names pop up. And one of the names is Olushe Gumobasanjo. If you want to understand today, you have to search yesterday. So, guys, let us dissect a little of Nigeria's yesterday politically. The name Olushe Gumobasanjo surely rings a bell. As it resonates with Nigeria, Africa and the world, perhaps because of providence which conferred on his personality the opportunity to rule and lead the most populous black nation in the world twice. As a military head of state and also as a civilian president. A generation which ignores history has no past and no future. That is the world of the elders. So from the historical perspective, let us extract the life and times of the one of the most controversial leaders ever produced on the continent of Africa, Olushe Gumobasanjo. Born as Olushe Gumathi Okikiola Ogumboye Aremu, son of Obasanjo, the septuagenarian is a Nigerian retired military officer and statesman who served as Nigeria's head of state from 1976 to 1979 and later as its president from 1999 to 2007. A favored man, you will say. A Nigerian of Yoruba descent, born on March 5, 1937. Olushe Gumobasanjo started his career when he enlisted in the Nigerian army in 1958 as a young man of 21. So young, you guess. Yes, he joined the military very early. He trained at the Holder Short and was commissioned as an officer in the Nigerian Army. He was also trained in India at the Defense Services Staff College, Wellington, and also at the Indian Military School of Engineering. He served at One Area Command in Kaduna, promoted to Chief Army Engineer, and Obasanjo was made Commander 2 of Area Command in July 1967. Obasanjo was also trained in DSSC, Wellington, during the Nigerian Civil War. He came to prominence. He commanded in the Hamis 3 Marine Commando Division that took Oweri, effectively bringing an end to the civil war. It is not a new thing that Obasanjo was a career soldier. Before serving twice as Nigeria's head of state, as a military ruler between 13th February 1976 to 1 October 1979, and as a democratically elected president from May 29, 1999 to 2007. As a man whom Nigeria has favored, of course, he has really found favor in Nigeria. He has served in various capacities at the top level of the country, including as the Federal Minister for Works and Housing in 1975. Obasanjo just served as the Minister of Defense from 1979. He also served as the head of state in 1976 to 1979. He was also the civilian president, as I have said earlier, and no less, he was the chairperson of the African Union in 2004 to 2006. Hmm. The question is, how did Obasanjo become the head of state in 1976? The military coup was led by Murtala Mohamed. Obasanjo supported the military coup and he was named Murtala's deputy in the new government. As we know, military coups don't just happen, it has to be planned ahead. Obasanjo was fully a part of the military coup, but he did not participate. He was just a member of the planning. However, the military regime was short-lived by the 13th February 1976 coup, led by Colonel Dinka. Yes, you heard it right, the famous Dinka. Murtala was killed during the attempted coup, but Obasanjo escaped death, surely a favored guy. The coup was foiled because the plotters Mr. Obasanjo and General Theophilus Danjuma, who is the chief of army staff and de facto number three man in the country. As a military head of state, Obasanjo's regime orchestrated many political repressions. In one particular instance, the compound of late Nigerian musical mistro and political activist Fela Ransom Kuti was raided and burned to the ground after a member of his commune was involved in an altercation with military personnel. Fela and his family were beaten, and his mother, a political and human rights activist, Femfomilayo Ransom Kuti, was killed by being thrown from a window. A coffin was carried to Obasanjo's barracks as a protest against political repression that was happening during his time as a military head of state. We cannot talk about Chief Obasanjo without the famous Operation Field the Nation he introduced during his regime. Obasanjo's military government embarked on what is termed the Green Revolution, distributing seedlings and fertilizers to farmers to increase nationwide productivity in farming. This initiative birthed the Operation Field the Nation OFN, which was meant to provide food security and reduce hunger that was ubiquitous during his sway as the military head of state. However, years later, the project, which was a national project, was covered and turned to a private enterprise of the former military leader, Olushe Gunwa Basanjo. All assets of the project that was termed Operation Field the Nation, especially the ones in Abi Okuta, the Ogun State Capital, are today in personal belongings of Olushe Gunwa Basanjo. He privatized all the machineries and also everything registered in government name 
were privatized to his name personally. Nigeria returned to democracy in 1999 and Chivolu Segun Obasanjo was favored again. He was elected as the president. As a civilian president, Obasanjo spent most of his first time traveling abroad. He succeeded in winning at least some Western support for strengthening Nigeria's nascent democracy. Britain and the United States particularly were won. However, his leadership, much as it recorded some notable achievements, such as increasing the gross domestic product GDP from 3% between 1999 to 2000 to 6% throughout his tenure, helped in part by higher oil prices because his regime recorded one of the highest oil prices in the history of Nigeria. Also, Nigeria's foreign reserves rose from $2 billion in 1999 to $43 billion on leaving office in 2006. We cannot ignore the corollary of debt pardons Obasanjo secured from the Paris and London club amounting to some $18 billion payment, which made Nigeria debt-free during his time. His government as a civilian president had several negatives to its history. One of the hallmarks of the Obasanjo regime as a civilian president was the many political assassinations that characterized his tenure. Among those who were said to have been politically murdered during Obasanjo's administration included the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, whose assassination case remained unsolved to today, Chief Bola Ige, popularly called Uncle Bola, and South-South politicians Chief Ari Masa, Chief A.K. Dikibo, a former senatorial candidate of the defunct All Nigeria's People's Party, AMPP in Imo State, Uche Hoji, architect Lai Balogun was also killed, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Nigeria, Musuka UNN, Professor Chimere Nkoku, former Chairman of the Nigerian Bar Association, MBA in Anambra State, Chief Banabas Igwe and his wife was also assassinated during the regime of Obasanjo as a civilian president. How about Chief Victor Nwankwo, of Fourth Dimension Publishers, as also Chief Funcho Williams in Lagos, among several others, just to mention a few of the political assassinations that happened during the eight-year administration of Obasanjo's civilian rule. Nigeria witnessed a major economic sabotage under President Obasanjo when he ceded the ownership of the Orish Bakasi Peninsula to Cameroon. There were also many cases of power usurpation recorded under the administration of Olusegun Obasanjo. Olusegun Obasanjo was embroiled in controversy regarding his third term agenda, a plan to modify the constitution so he could serve a third fourth year term as president. This third term agenda led to a political media opera in Nigeria and the bill was not ratified by the National Assembly. Obasanjo wanted to be president for life apparently. Obasanjo's third term agenda was the hallmark of the introduction of bribes to Nigeria's National Assembly. Furthermore, in March 2008, Obasanjo was indicted by a committee of the Nigerian parliament for awarding $2.2 billion worth of energy contract during his eight years of civilian rule without due process. We cannot talk about Obasanjo's 1999-2007 administration without mentioning his role especially as regards democratic tenets on the African continent rather than a leader worthy of emulation. The ECOWAS leadership largely sees Obasanjo as an anathema once saddled with leadership responsibility. For instance, a senior ECOWAS officer once said during an interview meeting over Ghana elections at some point, you know Obasanjo is a loose cannon. It becomes uncontrollable once bestowed with power. He called our former president a loose cannon and he told the media, studying Obasanjo keenly through the eyes of the public, the politicians and the media, Obasanjo happens to be the worst case study in leadership. Most Africans have not mastered the heart of leadership. And OBJ, as he is called, is one of the worst case studies ever to emerge on this planet. He no doubt has a big personality with a huge presence, but Obasanjo has never been the only indication of group leadership. Babai Yabo, as he is fondly called, is a very good example of a bull in the Chinese shop. A level 4 leader who never attained the height of a level 5. He was never meant to become great, but favor found him.